wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend. Who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of man? Oh, you've rescued the souls of man. Comforter, counselor, keeper spirit we long to embrace you offer hope when our hearts have hopelessly lost their way oh we've hopelessly lost our way hunger for oh our hearts always hunger for almighty infinite father faithfully loving Falling before your throne Oh, we're falling before your throne You are the one that we praise You are the one we adore You Hearts always hunger for, oh, our hearts always hunger for. Happy Easter. I hope, uh, hope your week is going well. And uh, the church might be empty, but so is the grave of Jesus. And we celebrate Easter today uh, in a very, very strange way. In fact, I was talking to Doris uh, McElrath, our, uh, our renowned pianist here at Community Bible Church. She's 90 years old, and she can throw it down with anybody. She's the, probably the greatest musician I've ever known. And I'm honored to serve with her here at the church. But I got to tell you, I said to her, Doris, this is really going to be a weird Easter. She said, tell me about it. She said, I have gone to church every Easter Sunday for 90 years. Now, that's got to be a record of some kind, don't you think? So this is the first time in 90 years or 91st Easter that she won't be able to be in uh, a church building, or as the, uh, my people used to say, the church house, because, you know, like, we're the church, but the, the church house is where they meet, right? That's kind of a more accurate way of putting it. But Doris said, what a, what a weird, weird Easter. She said they're doing well. I told you last week that Jim had, had bypass surgery, uh, her husband, and he continues to improve. Also, Tom Swan, who was in intensive care with COVID-19. He is recovering. He is out of the hospital. He is home. And we are all just so grateful about it. It's just such a great thing. So um, he wanted to thank you all for your prayers and concerns. Um, I know you're getting tired of being locked up in your house too, right? Um, Debbie sent me a, a message earlier today here in my study 
Um, and it simply said, I'm going to ask my mama if the offer to slap me into next year is still on the table. We would love to get beyond this, wouldn't we? Uh, but uh, it's going to be a little bit longer. But hey, there's some benefits. My buddy Tracy Brooks sent me a message this week that said he's getting in gas mileage. He's getting three weeks to the gallon right now. He's having just really a great run on, on gas. So he's, uh, he's doing well. But it's a, it's a strange Easter, but it's Easter. He's alive. He walked out of the grave. And that's what we really believe as Christians. By the way, if you don't believe this, you're not a Christian. You can be a member of a Christian church. You can use all the christian -y language. But if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then the, it's all a lie. I just want to say that I, I have no interest in building a religious organization. I have no interest... In, um, in necessarily doing what people consider to be religious stuff. I believe this. I believe that a dead man named Jesus, who was crucified just outside of the city of Jerusalem almost 2,000 years ago, that he was stone cold dead when they put him in the grave, just like the Bible says, and that three days later he walked out of there alive. And I said something last week that, that got uh, some of you on my... On my uh, on my Facebook feed, and some, I'm getting a lot of messages and messengers from you guys, um, that I made this statement that it's a historic fact that Jesus was raised from the dead. I knew that would light you up. I said it for that very reason. And I also said it because it's true. I love being right. Uh, that's a joke. But I do like being right. But anyhow, um, he really has been raised from the dead. And you try to say to me, what kind of scientific evidence can you give me? Do you understand science is only one of the disciplines and a very good one? But there are other disciplines like history and philosophy and theology. To be well-rounded, uh, have a well-rounded education, you need to be somewhat competent in all of those disciplines. So just being... Uh, just being a believer in scientism, that somehow science is going to have all the answers. And they have wonderful answers for us, and we're grateful. But you also have to study history. And when you study history, you have to look at evidence. Is it reasonable to believe that Jesus walked out of the grave? I say it is more than reasonable. I think it's irrefutable. I've just to trigger you again. <laughs> um, let me just say a couple of things. The resurrection of Jesus is at the heart of the message about Jesus. If a dead man did not get up and walk, then I am not interested in meeting with a bunch of people on Sunday morning because it doesn't mean anything. And all these things we read about in the Bible are not true because Jesus tied his resurrection to everything he said. They said, tell us what authority do you have to do the things you're doing. What proof can you give us that you have this authority? And Jesus said, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. He tied everything to his resurrection. That's John chapter 2. And if he wasn't raised from the dead, then it's all a lie. So I'm a golfer. I'd rather play golf on Sunday mornings than meet with people. I'd rather meet with my brothers on the tee box, you know, uh, instead of that, if it's not true. But for almost 45 years, I've been telling this story that Jesus, the Savior of the world, was crucified for us. And to prove that it was true and that his sacrifice was accepted by God the Father, he was raised from the dead. Now, what I want to say is just a, just a few simple things this morning. Number one. The apostles, the, the guys that followed Jesus, the disciples, you know, his friends. The apostles, they didn't invent this. I'm going to read to you from 2 Peter, chapter 1, beginning at verse 16. Peter said, We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. They didn't invent this. And he just came out flat out and said so. We didn't invent this. When, when um, the Apostle Paul was brought before a Roman ruler, he said to him, to Festus, he said to him, 
um, you know about this. This wasn't done in a corner. This wasn't something that was secretively done. This was something that was open that people knew about. If you read Josephus, the historian from the first century, he doesn't say he believed in the resurrection of Jesus, but he depicts it saying that the, his believers say it was true and that it happened. This is historical. And um, some think the apostles came up with this story of the resurrection because the, everything else had failed, that they were hoping Jesus would be a um, some kind of a political leader to save Israel from Rome's domination. Well, uh, when it failed, they said they, they came up with this resurrection idea, kind of like what cults do. Um, false religions do this all the time. Like the Jehovah Witnesses in 1914, they said Jesus was going to bodily return from heaven. By the way, we believe as Christians that one day Jesus will return. But they said he was going to return in 1914, you know, 100 and, 106 years ago. And when it didn't happen, the leader said, oh, you know what it was? It wasn't a bodily return. It was a spiritual return for him to struggle with Satan here in this world. Yeah, that's really a convenient shifting of, uh, of the story, isn't it? Well, they say, some people say that's what the apostles did, but that's not true. The reason it isn't true is because David foretold the resurrection um, in uh, the 16th Psalm. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One, capitalized, Holy One, see decay. You have made known the path of life. So the apostles pointed to this as a um, uh, pretelling of the resurrection of Jesus. But when you get to the whole story of Jesus himself and his life, Jesus spoke of his resurrection early and often. Like I'd already told you, it was in John chapter 2 at the very beginning of his ministry when he clears the temple and they say to him, what authority do you have to do this? And Jesus says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Well, he also said some other things. And um, Matthew records it in chapter 12 and 12 verse 40. He said, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Mark chapter 10, verse 33 and 34. Speaking of the Son of Man himself. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Now, the disciples didn't get it. You know, uh, what I love about the disciples, they weren't the sharpest tools in the shed. Okay, you know what I mean? They weren't the brightest light in the Christmas tree. It took them a while to understand it. But Jesus talked about it all the time. And there's some others that did get it. The leaders in Jerusalem, oh, oh they got it. They, uh, in fact, after the death of Jesus, we have Matthew um, writing about what they did to try to secure the tomb of Jesus. And now you understand Matthew, being a tax collector, had a lot of political connections. And so he was the one who would get us this information from that moment. The next day, the one after preparation day, that is for Passover, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while, while he was still alive, this deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure into the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. And this deception will be worse than the first. Take the guard, Pilate answered, go, make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone. That is the Roman seal. You didn't break that seal without death happening to you. And he also said, and posting the guard, this would be the, you know, the green beret. This would be the, the Navy seals of the day, the top guard. They're guarding the tomb just to make sure that that didn't happen. So they understood it. The disciples didn't quite get it. They didn't get it. So they couldn't have invented it. But Jesus talked about it often. And these, these leaders, you know, they got it. But So the apostles, 
They didn't make this stuff up. But secondly, I want to say, they didn't make it up, but they observed it. In fact, going back to 2 Peter chapter 1, where we started, it's very, very interesting. But he would say, For we did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his magnificence. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven. We were with him on the sacred mountain. That is when Jesus was transfigured. You can find it in the stories of the Gospels, that the first four books of the New Testament. Those are the, um, the, the, the uh, testimonies about Jesus' life. And um, he took Peter, James, and John up into a mountain with him. And there, Moses and Elijah, the old prophet, appeared and spoke with him about his upcoming death. And um, the apostles got to see it. They, they were there. I mean, that's, uh, that's pretty freaky. That, uh, that had to be quite an experience for them. In fact, let me also read to you what John said, um, old John. Now he wrote, of course, his gospel, and then three letters, first, second, and third John. And then the old man also wrote the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. And he was the only apostle that lived to uh, old age. But listen to how he depicts what he's telling you about. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. He was there. They observed this. They didn't invent it, but they observed it. Um, because of this evidence around the resurrection of Jesus, let me say something else offensive to the, those of you who don't believe, just because I love you and I want you to, I want you to get it. It's really important. Because of this evidence, the resurrection of Jesus, now hear me, the resurrection of Jesus is the best attested fact of human history. That's quite a statement, but it's true. I mean, they observed it. What that means is they were, they were eyewitnesses they had seen, that's what Peter said, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. They, they observed this. They saw it. Nobody told them about it. They saw it themselves. When I was uh, first moving into uh, the Clarkston area here in Michigan, um, our little town is, is a great little place. There was an old man in his 90s. His name was Bill Kelly. And he owned our, our local lumber yard, and he ran that yard alone. And he would throw lumber material around, and, you know, um, he, just, he just handled it all. And it had been there for, you know, a good hundred years before, before he owned it. And um, he was a, really a cool old man. And I, had a, I have a next-door neighbor. His name is Steve. Um, I call him Mr. Perfect because he is. The yard's always perfect. I'm always trying to somehow attain to uh, uh, to become, you know, like like Steve. You know, he's my hero. And he is in a lot of ways. He's our fire chief, was our fire chief, retired now. But Steve's father, Tink, he was our, our Independence Township supervisor. Before that, he was our Independence Township fire chief. One of truly one of the greatest men I ever knew. He was a wonderful man. But there's this story from 1928 when Tink was in the, the tummy of his mother. He had been conceived. Mom's pregnant. And dad worked at a service station in our little town of Clarkston. Um, it had been called Morgan Service for a lot of years. Um, um, and now it's a restaurant. But in those days, Tink's father... Um, was accidentally shot and killed inside that gas station. And when I researched it, when I got to know this family, I, I wanted to research it, and we saw Steve was showing me two different 
uh, reports, one from the Pontiac Press and the other from the Clarkston newspaper, and they, were, they didn't agree on the facts of what happened around Mr. Runk's death. So one day I'm buying lumber from Mr. Kelly, and I say to Mr. Kelly, did, did, you, know, did you know Tink's dad? He goes, ah, oh, knew him well. Yes, he was a good man. And I said, well, you know, the day that he was accidentally shot um, there at, the, at the, the, the station, they had a deer rifle they were handling around and they didn't realize it was, it was loaded and it discharged and went through the wall. And Mr. Ronk was working on a car in the next um, section and it, it hit him and killed him. I, I, sa I said to, to Mr. Kelly, um, I got these, these two articles, they, they, they don't agree. Which, which do you think was, is the right story? And Bill Kelly said, I was there. And he told me blow by blow of exactly what happened that day inside that little, that little filling station car repair place in downtown Clarkston when Mr. Ronk passed away. Forget the newspapers. I had an eyewitness. These guys were eyewitnesses. They didn't invent this story about Jesus. They only observed this story. In fact, they didn't invent it. They experienced it. They were in the midst of it all when it happened. And they were eyewitnesses. Read the New Testament. You read the story of Thomas, one of the disciples, saying, I don't believe this. You guys say you saw him alive. I'm not getting jerked around anymore. Forget it. That's my paraphrasing what he said. But he said, I'm not going to believe it unless I put my finger in the holes in his hands, put my fist in that gash that I saw in his side. I'm not going to believe it. And Jesus shows up and says, go ahead. And, and um, it's amazing because Thomas says, my Lord and my God. Um. These guys didn't invent it, but they observed it. They were eyewitnesses, and they told us the truth. Not only did all of that, let me make another point. They then proclaimed this. They told the story. What I mean by that is the resurrection of Jesus is the only reasonable answer to why these guys behaved like they did after the resurrection of Jesus. For instance, take Peter. Peter was a people pleaser. He, um, it was a terminal condition of his that he carried for his whole life. In fact, he had a problem um, trying to make political moves between the Gentile Christians and the Jewish Christians later on, and Paul had to call him out on that. He had this problem. And when Jesus was arrested, even though he had promised he would, he was would, willing to go to death with Jesus, um, he denied him three times and totally wimped out. Um, three days until the resurrection of Jesus, and then 40 days of Jesus being here on earth with them, that about 50 days after the crucifixion of Jesus, Peter is confronting the public in the temple area, proclaiming that Jesus was the Messiah and that he was raised from the dead, and he was willing to go through anything to tell that story. Okay, what happened? because he still had the proclivity. He still had this problem of, of people pleasing. We see that throughout his life by the other records in the New Testament. What happened was is that Jesus is alive. They didn't make this stuff up. They were eyewitnesses and they proclaimed it. My dad worked for years as a, a manager at Oakland County, different positions. He was the head of purchasing. He was the head of... Uh, he was a director in, um, under um, Dan Murphy. When it all started for him at Oakland County, he ran a division called Central Stores. They provided the food for um, the, uh, the jail and for the, for the hospital, and there was a rest home there, and then there was also um, uh, a juvenile detention center and other things. Um, Dad and his crew took care of all the, the food supplies because Dad had had a long career with the Kroger Company before that. He had these wonderful guys that worked with him. Everybody got nicknames. He nicknamed everybody. But there was a guy named David that worked for my dad. And uh, David had a brother. My dad never actually knew David's brother's real name. He was known by Skid Row. You can't make this stuff up. So David and Skid Row went out one night and they were drinking. 
and they sideswiped a state police car and ran from the scene. So David comes to work on Monday and tells my dad the story. Oh man, me and Skid Row, we sideswiped this cop car. Oh man, we're really afraid. Well, that's all you have to tell my dad because he was the practical joker of all practical jokers. So he called my uncle and asked my uncle to call their office and, um, you know, and act like a state trooper and say you're looking for David because you believe that um, um, he may have been involved in a hit and run on a state police car. So the phone rings. Um, my dad answers it. It's my uncle pretending to be a police officer. David, this is the state police, he says. And he gives it to David. And, and uh, this, this you know, my uncle is going on about, listen, we're going to have to come by and we're going to have to, we need to interview you. We believe that you were involved in a hit and run on, a, on one, of our, one of our vehicles. And uh, this is a very serious uh, uh, matter. And, and it, dad said that the, the, the color just drained out of David's face. And after it was all done, after the phone call was over, David hands my dad the phone and says, Lloyd, call Skid Row. Tell him the story stays the same. You know, if that was real, those guys would have folded like a cheap suit if they had the white light put on them and they were interrogated by the police. They wouldn't have been able to hold that story together. But the disciples held their story together. They held their story all the way to being executed for it. All of them, except for John, was executed. John was exiled, um, but um, the rest of them were executed, and they went to their deaths with these words on their lips. If you ever check out the life of Chuck Colson, he was the henchman for, for President Nixon during Watergate, and um, he said that he became a Christian because when he saw the resurrection story, he thought of how they tried to cover up all this stuff in, uh, in the Watergate crimes. They tried to cover it all up, and they couldn't hold it together for a week. And they were the most powerful men in the world. So how did these uh, lowly disciples keep telling this story the same for their whole lives? I'm going to tell you why. You ready? Because it's true. Because it, it happened. They didn't invent it. They were eyewitnesses. They observed it, and they proclaimed it. It's uh, pretty interesting. So, you know, you should never teach the Bible without asking a question at the end. So what? So what does that mean? Again, let me tell you what it means. Since Jesus was raised from the dead, that means everything he said is true. That he is the King and Lord of all the universe, that he is the creator, that he will one day be the judge of everyone who ever lived, and that we all are going to have to stand before him someday, but that he himself made a way for us to be forgiven and be made right with God. When he himself came and became a man and took the penalty of our sin on himself and died, on that cross, that they buried him in the grave and that he was resurrected from the, the grave, that it happened, that it's true. That means that when he said that we would be forgiven, it means it's true. Paul said that he, Jesus, was raised for our justification. That means we know that we're forgiven. It's real. You've been forgiven if you've trusted in him. And if you're carrying the weight of that still, you can be forgiven by trusting that Jesus died for you. It's, it's really true. Let me say something to you. This Easter, I know, it's, I know it's weird, but I said in the beginning of all this, maybe we can experience Easter the way they did on that very first Easter. I'm going to read to you one little statement. John chapter 20. Um, this is how they experienced the first Easter, Okay. Jesus has been crucified. He's been, he's been um, embalmed in the way they would do it then um, and placed in a grave. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, get this, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. We're in the midst of a pandemic. The doors are locked. 
We're locked in and there's fear. On that first Easter, Jesus showed up and he said, peace be unto you. Jesus will show up this Easter like he did in the first Easter with all of us in our houses alone, waiting for this pandemic to pass. Since he is alive, he is there with you. You can experience him like never before. So my friends, God bless you. May you have a blessed Easter. May this be a great, a great day for you as you contemplate not, uh, not the flowers and the fancy dresses and the big dinners, but all that's been stripped away so that we can enjoy the incredible magnificence, like Peter said, of Jesus and what he did for us. God bless you all. Let's pray together, okay? Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, thank you for what you did for us. Thank you for your death on that cross on Calvary, that hill. And thank you for your bodily resurrection from the grave to prove that it's true. And for all my friends listening to me today, I ask that you would invade the life of everybody listening, that we would understand who you are and what you have done for us. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, you have a great week. We're probably going to have a few more weeks like this together. Can't wait to see you all again. God bless you. Um, if you if you guys need anything, uh, go to cbcmi.com. You can make a request there if you need anybody to run for groceries or prescriptions or anything for you. Okay, God bless you all. And, uh, you know, um, I'm still around. If you, uh, you can email me at rev. Tom Hampton at gmail.com or through the website uh, if you'd like to talk. Okay? Thank you for listening. If you would like to support Community Bible Church, we would appreciate your prayers and gifts. We can be reached at Community Bible Church, 1888 Crescent Lake Road, Waterford, Michigan, 48327, or at our website, www.cbcmi.com. We'd appreciate your gifts. We know that many can't give right now. So if you would, you'd be a great blessing to your brothers and sisters. God bless you. Have a great day.